This is NC Spin, an unrehearsed discussion on issues of interest to North Carolinians. Now, here is your moderator, Tom Campbell. Welcome to this special edition of NC Spin. We've gathered four of the best news reporters and broadcasters to share their spin on in several important issues of the day in a special reporters roundup table. So let's introduce you to our panel of experts. They include Laura Leslie, Capitol Bureau Chief for WRAL in Raleigh, Patrick Gannon, editor of The Insider and the PAC Capital Press Association, Doug Clark, who returns to us, a columnist and editorial writer for the Greensboro News and Record, and Tom Lamprecht, Eastern Carolina's popular afternoon talk show host on WTIB and WNBU uh, in the eastern part of our state. Well, there are many issues we want to cover this week, and uh, it's going to be kind of unusual. Uh, it's, it's funny because these guys are used to asking the questions, and we're going to turn the tables on them and get them to answer the questions. And I want to begin by asking you to view our state from 5,000 feet up, kind of a macro view. Question one to all of you. How would you describe the state of our state today? I'm going to start with you, Laura. Uh, I think, I know you're trying to go macro, but i got to say, I think it depends where in the state you are. I think the economies are recovering in urban areas. We're seeing job growth and lower unemployment rates. But if you're out in the rural areas, um, that's not necessarily the case. And, you know, I think there's also a lot of po sort of political discontent. People are being deluged with negative ads. That has an effect on the way that they feel about the state, about the state of the state. Um, and coming into an election, of course, uh, that could always be interesting. Patrick? I would say unsettled, I think. And what I mean by that is uh, there are a lot of major issues uh, in legislative or legal limbo right now in the state. You have the voter ID legislation, school, school voucher legislation in the courts. You have uh, fracking rules being written. You have offshore drilling as a possibility coming up. You have the governor announcing a huge uh, transportation vision, but no, no way to fund it at this point. You have uh, unemployment uh, up and down. Uh, in the state, depending on the month. Um, you have a private new economic development uh, agency getting ready to take over job recruiting. So there's just a lot of issues that are that are unsettled. And, you know, it's going to be an interesting couple of years, I think. Doug Clark, from your view, give us a macro view. Well, I can see some college football stadiums down there, and there's a few good teams. Uh, <laughs> maybe not the one in Chapel Hill. One of them that wears purple. <laughs> yeah, they're pretty good. Oh. Uh, but uh, I, I think uh, there is some uh, grouchiness uh, out there because uh, things, uh, the economy is not coming back, as Laura said, in a lot of areas. And uh, Greensboro High Point is an area that's still struggling. And uh, I think uh, people are being hit with a lot of political ads, but they're not very enthusiastic about that many of the candidates uh, who are running. So uh, I, I think the, the mood is uh, unsettled. Tom Lamprecht, they talked about the rural part of the state, and, uh, uh, essentially east of I-95. You. You do a lot of work down right. there. You're the, talk, you're the guy that listens to the people calling in. What's your macro view? I think uh, cautiously optimistic. I mean, politically speaking, we're very purple, and uh, not just because the Pirates uh, beat uh, Chapel Hill so soundly, but that You helps. worked that in there so smoothly. <laughs> we're still a purple state. I, I'd say cautiously optimistic. I think if you look at the year-over-year -year numbers, uh, for unemployment, we're a point and a half better in July than we were a year ago. Uh, housing starts were up 40 percent in July. So I, I, I would, you know, we got a long way to go, and I would have a capital C on cautiously optimistic. But I actually think things are are beginning to turn in the right direction. But uh, with the current administration, I know we're talking state politics, but. The, the negative feedback I hear is on national politics. Well, I, let, let, me, let me delve into that a little bit. Governor McCrory likes to talk about what he calls a Carolina comeback. Mm -hmm. uh, the latest unemployment report shows that we lost 18,000 workers uh, in, in the month of August. And in fact, we're 14,000 jobs lower than we were in 2007. Um, a lot of people say in this economy, this recovery has stalled out. What do you think? I think maybe it's premature to say it's stalled. If you look at uh, Governor McCory came in in uh, January 2013, every month uh, unemployment has either been the same or gone down up till May of this year. May it ticked up, June it stayed the same, July it ticked up, August unemployment ticked up. And I think uh, it is uh, something that he's going to have to keep an eye on. I mean, he does like to tout the uh, comeback, and if it doesn't, uh, if it keeps ticking up, uh, I don't think you're going to hear as much uh, touting from him. 
But I do think, uh, you know, I talked to the folks down at, at Bosch in uh, New Bern. They make uh, dishwashers, appliances. They're setting record numbers. Uh, talk to the folks in, uh, at Heister Yale to make forklift trucks. They're not as enthusiastic as Bosch is, but, but they're, they're looking in the right direction. Doug, talking about Governor McCrory, I, I think most people would say it took him a while to sort of get his footing uh, as governor of North Carolina. But some say that during the past few months, they really sort of feel like he is, is taken charge and taken hold and is, is uh, more comfortable being governor. You've written about that a little bit. What do you think? Well, I think every time it appears he gets his footing, he, he slips. Uh, and uh, I think we saw that uh, with his uncertain response to the coal ash bill. He didn't, he didn't like it. He wasn't going to sign it, but he wasn't going to veto it. And uh, he, he, he said uh, he's going to seek an advisory opinion from the Supreme Court about the constitutionality of the coal ash commission. Well, he, he's not going to get an advisory opinion from the Supreme Court. So now he's come out with a very ambitious and forward-looking transportation plan, but he's going to need an awful lot of cooperation from the legislature, and uh, it's uncertain. Laura, the, the, the state controller just recently said for the first two months of the year, State revenues are $200 million below what they were last year. Um, our, our legislative leaders say, don't worry about it. We sort of factored that in. We knew that there was going to be some slippage, and we built uh, a, a lot of reserves. Um, how big a deal is that? It is a pretty big deal, and here's why. I mean, they were already down about $445 million, $475 million because of the tax cuts that were implemented. Um, and so they had projections that were on the books as what they were expecting to see, $475 million less. What they saw was $680 million less. And this was, at the, this was at the very beginning of this fiscal year as the budget negotiations were still underway. That is substantially more than they set aside to cover it. So, I mean, you could argue that the budget that they pass is already out of whack unless that turns around. And you, that goes back to your question about the Carolina comeback. I think the most convincing evidence we have that it is stalling is the fact that those revenue figures are not growing because the economy and wages are not growing the way that they were projected to grow. And, and, and Patrick, so far as it goes, talking about that, this unemployment, we are reportedly in a, cover, a recovery. but. From where you sit, how would you judge this recovery that we are having in North Carolina? I think it goes back to what Laura said at the beginning. I mean, I think you're seeing pockets of, of recovery. I think there are areas of the state that are doing well. We hear jo job announcements in Charlotte, in Raleigh uh, seemingly every week, in Cary, places like that. But in the rural parts of the area, we just had a, a poverty report come out that showed there's still a lot, a lot of people living in poverty and, and with no real signs that, it, that that's improving. So I think, you know, it's it's... It depends on where you are and who you are, I think. Well, I got good news. You can have additional video content from our panel and other leading opinion makers all on our website, ncspin.com. After each show, we tape what we call the after spin. Our panelists get to tell you what they wish they'd said, as well as give comments on other topics. And in addition, we have NC Spin perspectives pose, uh, posted throughout the week, some from these same people around this table. So keep up throughout the week by visiting ncspin.com. Also catch us on Facebook and at NC Spin Tweets. Balanced debate for the old North State. Well, when we come back, we're going to talk about the voucher funds that were released. NC Spin will return after these messages. My name is Bernie Teal. Sunburst Farms has been in my family for over 35 years. Last year I had to do something I'd never done before. Destroy 10 acres of good squash. I wasn't able to find enough workers. The opportunity is there. American families are demanding locally grown vegetables and I want to provide that to them. So please tell Congress that we need immigration reform now. We had the same hopes and dreams as, as any parents. We knew that something was wrong with Samuel. When the doctors told us autism, my heart sank. We knew we had to give Samuel a chance. When I found out that the insurance companies were denying coverage for the therapy that Samuel needed, I couldn't believe it. That was, that was our struggle at first, is, is, is how are we going to pay for it? Tom Tillis understood those challenges and, and was a huge advocate for us. We're regular people, and Tom Tillis saw a need he fought for it. Tom Till has, uh, has taken the, the politics and big insurance to the side and tried to do the right thing for families from North Carolina. Daniel is sweet and bubbly. I never would have thought that he would be where he is right now. 
It's truly amazing. I'm thankful for each and every breath that he uses to call me mama. Tom Tillis clearly has shown that he'll fight for people like us. People like Samuel. Carolina Rising is responsible for the content of this advertising. We now return to NC Spin. Even though Superior Court Judge Robert Hobgood ruled North Carolina school voucher law was unconstitutional, the NC Court of Appeals ruled last week that those students who'd been approved for publicly funding vouchers can receive the money. Laura, does this Court of Appeals ruling give us any sign as to whether the, the Court of Appeals believes the voucher program is constitutional? And if, if they don't, why release the funds? Well, there's a couple of answers to that. Number one is they may think that the Supreme Court is going to find it constitutional. Because you may remember, the same judge earlier this year blocked the lottery from going forward. And he was overturned. And, and was overturned by the Supreme Court on much the same arguments. Although his arguments in this latest block, this permanent injunction, were much more um, in-depth, uh, there's still a very good chance the Supreme Court won't agree with them. And in the meantime, you've got you know hundreds of kids at this point, who or thousands, who hundreds, I think, who had a lot of them had started classes already. You know, these families had committed they were in classes, you know, they were kind of left hanging. And, and I've got people who are opposed to vouchers say, well, that's too bad, and the schools will have to take care of it. But, I mean, there is a question of sort of the faith and credit of the state at that point, you know, that the state has said we're going to pay for this, and all of a sudden but we're But there not. was some suggestion that maybe if the Court of Appeals, uh, if, if the Supremes rule that it is unconstitutional, they may have to go back and get those funds back. How hard is that going to be, Tom? That's going to be hard. Uh, <laughs> I, don't, I don't see that happening. I, I'm... A little surprised that Hobgood ruled like he did. You know, this is nothing brand new. I mean, it's a, not the exact same thing, but my two daughters went to private colleges, and uh, one to Elon and one to Wingate, both church based. Legislative tuition tax credit. Right. Well, the, they were handed $2,000 to uh, help pay for the, their tuition. Well, so the, the argument that, that, that Hobgood makes about that is that it's, it's K to 12 that is guaranteed in the Constitution. The Constitution doesn't speak to higher education. So. But his argument it was that these uh, children were doing a disservice to these children. They're not going to get a proper education. Right. And I think he has a hard time making that point. I, I disagree. I think the Leandro rulings, which he leaned on, say the, the state has an obligation to provide a sound basic education and how do you do that when you're paying to send kids to schools that, that you have uh, uh, no uh, oversight over and, and, and are essentially unaccountable? Well, uh, then in place of accountability there so that uh, they can be held accountable. And they do have to take standardized tests. So, I mean, there is some accountability. Patrick, the, the Bob Orr, who uh, is a, a frequent panelist on the show, former Supreme Court Justice, said in, in regards to this ruling, he thought everybody got half a loaf. Uh, you reported that in the Insider. What do you think he meant? You just uh, stumped me on that one. Okay. Actually. I think what he was talking about was the fact that the, the Court of Appeals said no more money can ah, go out. Okay. But the money that was already supposed to be released that Hopgood blocked can go out. And okay. so they can both claim that they won. Well, I wondered bit. about it when I read it. I mean, I, 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 he didn't explain himself, and I didn't call Bob up and ask him about it, but I wondered about that. All right, so <laughs> it, it, any notion how this thing is going to be resolved? I mean, obviously, it's going to end up in the Supreme Court. Uh, now we've got uh, a superior court judge saying it's unconstitutional, a court of appeals making a ruling that we really don't quite know what it, what it means. Any, any notions on how this is going to turn out? I would just guess it's going to the Supreme Court, and I think they'll rule well, it constitutional. Do you? Do you? And, and I think they'll go the opposite way because I think they'll back up their own Leandro rulings. Interesting. Patrick? Well, I agree. Yeah. I agree that I think they'll rule the way they ruled earlier and let the lottery go forward. I think if they were going to find it unconstitutional, they'd have done it earlier this year. Interesting. All right. After these messages, we're going to talk about Medicaid turning the corner, perhaps. NC Spin will return after these messages. Hi, I'm Linda Loveland. I want the best for my kids. Feeding them foods they like within my budget is a priority. But what do we really know about these foods? North Carolina farmers and food experts give you a website to find it all. FeedTheDialogueNC.com, a place where moms like you and me can learn more about the foods we eat and the farmers that feed us. Check it out. Add your input and help feed the dialogue. Let's talk food at FeedTheDialogueNC.com.
The best part about being a member of a Touchstone Energy Cooperative is that it's your Touchstone Energy Cooperative. Learn more about the power of your co-op membership at TogetherWeSave.com. North Carolina's Touchstone Energy Cooperatives, looking out for you. We knew that something was wrong with Samuel. When the doctors told us autism, my heart sank. When I found out that the insurance companies were denying coverage for the therapy that Samuel needed, I couldn't believe it. Tom Tillis saw a need and he fought for it. Tom Tillis understood those challenges and, and, and was a huge advocate for us. Tom Tillis has taken the politics and big insurance to the side and tried to do the right thing for families in North Carolina. Carolina Rising is responsible for the content of this advertising. We now return to NC Spin. One of the topics we've discussed almost as frequently as the elections this year has been Medicaid. DHHS Secretary Aldana Bosch testified to the Joint Governmental Operations Committee that for the first time since 2006, it appears that Medicaid may have spent less last year than was budgeted. She also testified she might be proposing to the governor to expand Medicaid as allowed under Medi Obamacare. Patrick Gannon, after all the stories that have been written about Medicaid budget shortfalls the last few years, uh, the surplus was good news, and I'm wondering why the media didn't give it more play than they did. It's a good question. I think Laura's probably written 100 stories on the <laughs> Medicaid shortfalls in the last few years. But for one, uh, DHHS officials say that they do expect to end the fiscal year in the black when all the numbers are in. All the numbers aren't in yet. We still have outs outstanding Medicaid claims. Um, from last year, so I think there's uncertainty still about whether what the number is going to be when when it's all said and done. I think 63 million is a number that's um, been estimated as a surplus. You also have to fact, factor in the fact that that the General Assembly put hundreds of millions of dollars of extra money into the Medicaid system. So when you have 63 million left at the end of, of the year, but you put in 500 million uh, beforehand, what does that really say? Is that really a surplus or? You know. Well, Tom, okay, the subject has been Medicaid reform all mm -hmm. through the course of the last year or so, ever since the governor took office. The impetus behind Medicaid reform was so that we could have a better handle on budgeting and cost controls. Okay, if we're back on solid financial footing, does that remove or relieve the impetus for having Medicaid reform? In terms of expansion? I, I think uh, it's, it's good to be solvent. I think it's good to be in the black. And if they can uh, finish this year, as Patrick says, after all the bills are paid and we're in the black, that's a good thing. I don't know that you want to uh, go down the road that uh, puts the uh, North Carolina taxpayer under more obligations. Uh, I know everybody's looking at the uh, federal dollars out there that are going to be there for a few years, but then uh, we start paying a percentage of that. And but, Laura, the Medicaid Reform Committee started meeting this week. Uh, what's, what's going on with that? Well, this, the, numbers, the numbers are clear. I mean, North Carolina's program isn't growing any faster than the U.S.'s numbers. We're at average rate, about 65 to 7% projected growth a year. The trouble is our revenue is not expected to grow at that rate, which means if you do the math that there are going to be bigger and bigger bites out of the budget every year to pay for that program. So, you know, solvent is good, but they're trying to find ways to, you know, to move that number, to inch that number down a little bit. And, and you know, I don't know that we'll see a 7.0% rate of uh, revenue growth any time in the next <laughs> decade or so, but, you know, they're trying to get Not a in this closer. lifetime. Exactly. Uh, sure. Doug, at the end of the, of the day, part of the controversy surrounding all this of, uh, involves Secretary Bosch. In fact, you've written about this some. Uh, to some extent, some of the, the pushback, particularly in the Senate, has been over her personally. you see that getting any better? Well, I, I, yes, I think it's going to get better. Uh, the governor's sticking with her. She, she's his woman, and uh, she, if she can demonstrate she's starting to get a grip on that, uh, then uh, I think that strengthens her position. Uh, it, so much of this is a political football. We had an interview today with Senator Kay Hagan and challenged her, who's a friend of uh, Dr. Vosh, to, to, to intervene. Uh, if, if Hagen wants uh, North Carolina to expand Medicaid, work directly with Dr. Vosch, work with the uh, HHS secretary in Washington, work out some kind of arrangement like the state of Pennsylvania has done, uh, something that uh, would be uh, politically acceptable to all sides and maybe good for the state. You know, let's get something done. Any hint? I mean, she said that she's going to be presenting the governor some options on this. Any hint on what they could be? Well, they've been working on this for quite a while. Oh, I'm sorry, which she? 
uh, Secretary Bosch. Yeah. Said okay. Sorry, I want to make sure we're yeah. talking yeah, about sure. Senator Hagan. Uh, she, they've been working on their reform plan for about a year and a half now. They've been holding meetings with stakeholders. Uh, they're, you know, they've rolled out some suggestions. The trouble is, the Senate says they don't move quickly enough. The Senate has much more, um, I would say, uh, in depth and, and wide, sort of wide ranging ideas about how to, to completely restructure the department, take Medicaid out of HHS completely. Uh, the House and the governor are taking a much more sort of subtle approach, and they say, first, let's fix it before we move it, because we need to make sure we set it up to work right for what it's they're going just, to do. They're not saying no, they're just saying not now. They're saying slowly. Yeah, yeah. All right, after these messages, we want to talk about the elections. Be interesting. NC Span is brought to you in part by the North Carolina Farm Bureau. The Farm Bureau and Agriculture. We keep North Carolina growing. Does your North Carolina business or organization have a story to tell? I'm Richard Campbell, and at Carolina Broadcasting and Publishing, we help tell stories that connect you to the people who will respond. We take the time to understand our clients' needs and what makes them unique. We craft their stories through the efficient use of words, images, and videos that resonate with their desired audience. We also know that a good story is incomplete without a call to action. On video, on air, online, and in print, from concept to final production, no one can help tell your story more effectively or affordably than we can. For special introductory offers, visit carolinabroadcasting.com or call 919-832-1416. Again, that's carolinabroadcasting.com. Let us help tell your story today. Your family physician supports Medicaid reform. That's good for North Carolina patients, providers, and taxpayers. For over a year, we've worked with the governor and the General Assembly on a plan for responsible Medicaid reform. The Senate's proposed Medicaid changes are a departure from this plan. Changes that could lead to a decrease in the number of primary care physicians providing care in communities that need them the most. The destruction of our state's medical home network a network that prevents unnecessary hospital and emergency room visits. And disregards the elderly, the blind, and disabled, and the health care they need. Care we're morally and legally obligated to provide. Now is not the time to disregard the progress we've made. Now is the time for lawmakers to implement responsible Medicaid reform that protects and improves health care for all North Carolinians. Visit rnchealthcare.com and tell your lawmaker to support responsible Medicaid reform. Are you concerned for the future of rural North Carolina? Then join the North Carolina Rural Center and other business and government leaders for the 2014 NC Rural Assembly on October 30th at the Doubletree in Raleigh. Register online at ncruralcenter.org. We now return to NC Spin. In five weeks, voters will mark their ballots for the November 4th general elections, and a lot of us will be glad to see an end of the ugly TV ads, phone calls, and direct mail pieces that have accompanied this election. We want our reporters to quickly give us uh, their reaction to perspective of what to expect. Doug, even though most consider this race to be neck and neck, uh, obviously the big, uh, the big ticket item is, is the U.S. Senate race, first term incumbent Kay Hagan seems to have taken the lead. Why is this the case? I, I could only guess uh, because uh, more likely voters are women and she's uh, got a big lead among women. Uh, Tom, Charlie Cook, Cook Political Report, says that the thing that's going to give Hagan victory is boots on the ground. She has the best ground game of the two candidates. I think the thing that could give it to Hagan is the fact that I don't think Tom Tillis has done a good job to convince uh, voters why they should vote for him. He's done a good job pointing out Kay Hagan's flaws. Challengers don't win elections against incumbents unless they paint a picture, cast a vision of why the voters should vote for them, and I don't think Tom Tillis has done a good enough job on that yet. Patrick, this race has been basically bereft of issues. I mean, we have, I mean it's been more attacks than it has been issues. Um, how is that affecting the unaffiliated voters, which are now 26 percent and in some counties are the majority of voters? I think it's starting to get a little more into the issues. We've had the foreign policy debate over ISIS recently, um, but, I, but I agree it has been attack ad after attack ad. Every time you go to turn on the TV, it's, it's, it's them again, you know. Um, so 
And I think I think a lot of the viewers have just turned off and tuned out. Yeah, I mean, what negative ads do well is suppressed turnout, and this is already a midterm election. I was going to ask you, what are you yeah. predicting the turnout's going to be I here? suspect the turnout's going to be low. I don't think there's a lot of excitement on either side, and, you know, negative ads after negative ads for a year now. I mean, I don't, I, I, a day without a mailer in my house is like a day without sunshine, and, <laughs> you know, I mean, people just don't get excited about races like that. We call it the Broadcasters Full Employment Act. As <laughs> we as, do. <laughs> as far as that's concerned. Any other races that you guys are watching uh, that ought to be interesting, the judicial, legislative? Uh, there's a few legislative races for sure in both the House uh, and the Senate. There's not, there's not all that many, and nobody thinks that, that either the House or Senate's going to uh, shift parties this year. But there are, there are some races in the West and the East uh, particularly. Um, what could be important we'll be though, is that the Senate could actually lose its uh, super, super majority, majority, and yeah. that could make things really interesting. All they got to do is lose three seats. Well, we want to thank you guys for uh, sharing your spin. It's a, it's a unique situation having you answer the questions instead of asking them, and we appreciate you doing it. We hope you, the viewers, have enjoyed watching this, and if you like us doing these reporters' roundtables, let us know. To stay informed all during the week, give your feedback, read our columns, visit the website ncspin.com, or catch us at NC Spin on Facebook. Next week, Brad Crone will be sitting in this chair, and NC Spin will take on more issues of interest to the people. Until then, stay informed and watch out for the spin. Join us next week and get the spin on issues facing our state.